Our complete library of episodes is available for free at spotlightonpodcast.com slash episodes. There you'll find all of our conversations stretching back to our launch in February of 2020. Check it out. Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today, the spotlight shines on Belfast, Ireland band Chalk. Chalk is Ross Cullen on vocals, Ben Goddard on guitar, and Luke Nyblock on drums. They cook up a pretty stunning racket with a unique sound that is nonetheless recognizable in its post-punk dance industrial lineages. If that makes sense to you, you'll love Chalk. If it does not, give them a listen. Chances are you'll dig what they do. This is the second of two episodes I recorded on site in my hotel room slash recording studio at the South by Southwest Conference and Festival in Austin, Texas. The recording took place two days after Chalk pulled out of South by Southwest to protest the festival's commercial alignment with the U.S. Army and multiple weapons manufacturers. They were one of at least 10 Irish artists to do so. The band opened up about their process and their musical development in this great discussion. Enjoy. day for rock and roll i would imagine but thank you for making it that's okay yeah jet lag still actually we've been okay with jet lag we're still yeah. just early rising we got some good rest we've slept well we're feeling quite regulated yeah i'd say yeah we've adjusted we've adjusted mm-hmm. yeah i take it you're not having the south by that you planned on having we're here for we came with our girlfriends and then everything so we're here for um a couple of days now just in, taking in the city mm-hmm. of austin which is great like, have you seen any music yeah, we've seen a couple of different acts. Mm-hmm. I think there was an act called Artless Jab, who were really cool. It was their first show at the Coral Snake. Yeah, they were great. You guys yeah, saw someone May, yesterday. May Simonez from New York City. Mm-hmm. She played at uh, Tweedies oh, nice. in Central Austin. We just walked in. Yeah, we just happened by chance upon that gig, and it was really cool. There was a lot of like Boston and Nova influence, and it was a great show. Really cool venue as well. It was just outdoors. They were just playing by this tree in like, this outdoor area at the pub. Yeah. It's really cool. Those are the kind of gigs I think I love just showing up and just seeing an artist I've never heard of. It's what South by is great for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Enjoying that and hopefully over the next few days we can do a bit more of that, of course, as well. Yeah. Have any of you been to Austin before? Is this your first trip to the States? I've been to New York a couple of times, like just family holiday stuff. But yeah, all of us first time in Austin. Yeah, first time in the States for Ross and I. My mom and dad got married in Hawaii like 20 years ago. Oh, there you go. We were in San Francisco and then we went to Hawaii. So oh, that was oh, only like that size, so I can't yeah, really remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, it's been, I mean, the city, to be fair, first impression of the city, it's been great. Yeah. It's, it's a really cool place. Obviously, we're not used to the, it feels very hot for us, I don't know, about locals, but yeah. we're coming from like eight or nine degrees Celsius weather um, back home at the minute. So it's been adjusting to the heat as well. But the city's been amazing, um, yeah. really cool. The skylines, it's, yeah, it's something a lot bigger than Belfast anyway. Yeah. Scale, but. Yeah, really cool. It's interesting you say that about the heat because uh, I was dreading coming down because it can be very punishingly hot here this time of year. Mm-hmm. And it's actually pretty mild. Yeah. Irish for you. Yeah. yeah, we're like, ooh, it's hot. <laughs> really warm right now. <laughs> Not yeah. warm at all. Yep. When I was preparing for our time together, one of the things that I read, I forget which publication it was, but it was basically like trying to describe the genre that you guys operate in. Mm-hmm. And it said you were pulsating techno rock. <laughs> and I was like, you know, it's one of those things where I'm not big on asking artists to talk about genre or, or categorize themselves. But I was like, well, those, those kind of meaningless words. And then as I listened to you more, I was like, actually, it is kind of pulsating techno rock. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's certainly been a lot of different terms branded around about the band sound and things. I, mean, I think there's definitely words that we've all discussed mm-hmm. in the past when we were trying to formulate that. Signed and mm-hmm. pulsating. That's a great word. Yeah, I'll take that. That means to me there's a lot of energy there, and if people are getting that from the music, I think that's what mm-hmm. we're after, really. Something quite rhythmic about pulsating as well, yeah. isn't there? Which it's feels good. appropriate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's definitely these are the old things we've discussed definitely in the past. And yeah, there's been all sorts of Berg Berghain Rock was one we got. You know, referencing the the club in, in Berlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a cool one. Yeah, like, we're just kind of happy for people to 
say what they feel with the music and we we'll, and yeah. yeah it's great we like people having different opinions and and views on the sound so is there a governing principle or like a mission statement for the band like how do you think about when you're starting a project is there a do you have to sit around and say all right here's the objective here like you might with an outside producer or something like didn't not really but i think we each sort of came together wanting to do something a bit different in the region of just our city belfast and even now that scope has grown to ireland and trying to do something that's new to us but still taking in the influence influences around us but i think we're still so early on in this stage of our careers that we're still trying to figure ourselves out as people as well. And I think that the tool of the band is maybe helping us find ourselves a yeah. bit more. At least, personally, that's what I'm hoping to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say that like early days of the band, we were very good at talking and like conceptualizing things and mm -hmm. we weren't really playing gigs, so a lot of the conversation was just around, okay, what is the objective? Like, we definitely have those discussions about trying to cross the borders between punk and, and, and dance and techno and how, how can we achieve that and get a bit of everything from our city like into one kind of group of music you know essentially so mm -hmm. we definitely were really good at talking and visualizing things and trying to manifest mm -hmm. that like you say mm -hmm. before we were even starting the gig you know and I think just all that talking and it was always in our heads that whole time and then I think it made writing the music just a little bit easier for us mm -hmm. early on um, because we had this idea of the sound just from flashing light through conversation. It's good when you do stuff like that as well because it's, if you talk about it a lot, even when you're not actively doing it, you're always thinking about it as well. It's like when you even when you're writing, if you're not like physically writing, it's going over in your head and having. Yeah, we had a long time where we kind of, and still like, and obviously. We're growing as a band and things are changing and we're finding out the things that work for us but yeah it's a really could only recommend like trying to really spend the time to figure out what you want to do and then just try your best to encapsulate that in any way you can What, if any, significance does being from Belfast in particular and Ireland generally have on you? You know, you, you mentioned that sort of integrating the influences around you. I took that to mean music, but what might that mean more broadly for each of you or all of you? It's probably just like, an, it's definitely felt at some level of angst to the city, you know what I mean? So there's always going to be somewhat of an aggression to our music, I think. I don't think we ever want to lose that kind of heavy side to the music. I think we always want to have that in the spirit of it. And I think that is maybe something that you're born with in, mm -hmm. in Belfast. Obviously, it has a troubled past, mm -hmm. but it's not something we necessarily directly attach to the music, but it's definitely something that's like subconsciously there, this kind of rebellious spirit. And that just comes through with the bashing nature of some of the songs we have. Um, it's a pulsating techno rock. Pulsating <laughs> techno <laughs> nature yeah. of the songs. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, probably Roski could probably touch a bit more on the techno part of the city as well, because Belfast is quite enriched with the techno culture as well. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, the dance side of Belfast is like the biggest genre there for like gigs and concerts and whereas compared to somewhere like Dublin the sort of guitar bands are more like the popular side so yeah as we talked about early days trying to bring something from both worlds together and it was a long process because we were a completely different band when we started we were basically like on the verge of that sort of wave of bands like Parquet Courts we were big fans of and just that sort of wave of the British guitar bands in the last five years, we were sort of watching everyone do like a lot more 
of the spoken word thing and the guitars thing, like that sort of idea of the, the post-punk revival. Like we were very much aware of it, but now we've come out and realised, you know, we just want to um, take what's around us, the dance scene in Belfast, and like right, we all enjoy that sort of side of things as well, trying to do something new, trying to challenge ourselves and not just fall into this sort of pigeonhole of that word just another sort of project. I sort of lost the plot a little bit in reading about you guys. In terms of your history, I'm, I think I understand you came together in school, in film school? Yes. What, what's the timeline though? What, like when did that all start? Because I've seen references to like, we've been together a long time, mm -hmm. but then when I see some of the years that are referenced, it doesn't seem like that long ago. Mm -hmm. And it also seems like a lot of what's been going on has happened kind of quickly for you guys mm -hmm. from like the mid late pandemic. So, I don't know, could you just kind of root yourselves in time for me? We all met in university. We started university in 2017. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And we met, was it the first or second? It was probably well, yeah. the first. Well, Ben and I met originally. Yeah. And we started throwing around the concept of starting a band just because I knew he played guitar. Yeah. I was drumming for years at the time. And we always threw the idea of maybe starting something as a band together. But I don't think we ever rehearsed together or anything else to it. It was just yep. this idea we had in conversation again. We were good at talking, you know, early mm -hmm. on. Um, and we were talking about like Courtney Barnett covers and things like that, you know, just mm -hmm. all these indie rock tunes, you know. And then I think close probably the second year at uni, we discovered through Ben's partner that Ross had this kind of poster in his room. It was like this uh, Van Gilla band from Dublin. Mm -hmm. And we knew immediately that Ross would be into a similar kind of mm -hmm. uh, range of music to us too. So mm -hmm. I think we had that conversation then with Ross and we formed from there. So it did start at uni. I think it's something probably... The thing is though, so that starts around 2017, but our first gig, is it like 2019? 20, well, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's why we talk about it's like a long, but also like we're all friends really as well. And I suppose the fact we were in film school, we were like there to like learn how to make films. That's why we are, so it wasn't so that we talk about like we were a band, but we were like great friends and we're learning film, but then we're kind of slowly starting to like rehearse and stuff and it's like a slow thing. So that's why it's like, it feels longer for us, but I mean, we are, and then the, when did the debut single come out? Yeah, so it was uh, 2022, them came out. Yeah, it was, we all kind of, we, me and you lived together mm -hmm. and we responded to write music and give, give it a go. And the music was written around probably 2021 was the first sort of inklings of Chalk, mm -hmm. the project that we were in before. We had our friend Ethan, who was the bassist. We were called a different name. And then we just took that time off with lockdown and things like that. And we decided to take the project a bit further, something new for us, and yeah, that's yeah. enter chunk. Mm -hmm. So when Luke says it's good to talk about stuff, and we did, he does mean three years. It was a lot of like, years. It's not just like, yeah. it was like, we had other things, obviously, what, yeah. but it was like fun, it was a part of it. That's and that's it feels like a long time, yeah. It, yeah. It's genuinely takes a long time to really just push through and do it and like, get the first song right. And, I think that's why probably you've heard in the past, maybe through previous stories about the band, that it has taken a while. Yeah. I think in our heads it did. The other thing that's important to remember is that, first of all, 2017 is a while ago now, yeah. but the pandemic just warped time so much. Yeah. I mean, I can't even fathom 2019 anymore. I don't even, it's this yeah, what is that? distant yeah. place in time. What role did the lockdown play? First of all, were you able to be near each other and work together, or did it force you to stop were there any positives in terms of your development well, yeah well, definitely yeah yeah it forced us we were all living in belfast and we all moved back home with we were still in our final year of um, film school so we had things to be doing but i found myself a bit more involved in the making demos i was getting more into we would have normally wrote in the room or one of us would have wrote a song and brought it in but i was getting used to Logic Pro X and with an audio interface and getting more into that and recording things. And from that, like I think maybe three, four months into the pandemic that like I we, like, already had three or four demos like that I could send to the guys that were that had drums that were just from the software just as a demo. And I would never had that before. So it forced into the room lots more time to do things. Yeah. And I was able to send the guys like some of my early ideas it kind of did prove to be like a blessing. I don't know if, if we were still in university and living there, I don't know if it would have happened. Yeah, it just gave us time to get hands on. I think like obviously we we're still abiding by rules and there was a period of time where I went to their house and moved in for a month yeah. and we brought like the electronic drum kit and that was the first time I actually started really adding things to like logic files and like 
you had all these ideas that were finally being flashed out and developed, and that's where the, the debut single came from, you know. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we had like a pretty solid demo, what we thought was the, the the bulk of the song, the skeleton, we just we got in touch with Chris Ryan, and I'm sure we'll talk about further. Um, our producer and, and he was really interested in the demo and we just worked from there and we finally had something that felt like a song uh, rather than just an idea mm -hmm. we also couldn't do anything but write songs yeah or something. there was yeah. like there was no like we were working it was pretty good it was like covid pay and stuff like that no you couldn't do anything or like you couldn't yeah. work on yeah, film yeah. or like work in general everyone was like people just weren't working and you couldn't like couldn't even go to gigs or any yeah. shows or something like that and because we were around each other it was like okay well and then my ideas were forming and it was around them from what Ross was saying, like when those original demos were happening, it was like, okay, this is something. And it was different to the stuff that we were thinking about or playing like the few years before, you know, but it was like, okay, it finally felt like, oh, this is actually our sound here. And it took that time, but it's, we were just maybe different where we never like gigged to find our sound. We just, maybe it's like, it was a more maddening way of doing it. Mm -hmm. That's why when we released the song, like it, it, it was a thing where like, nobody knew who we were because like we weren't a band because we didn't yeah. play even though we'd been together for four years we, we'd never really played a show yeah, we weren't in the music scene or anything we weren't like kind of pillars of music of any kind of music no. scene and so when the song came out i was like what the hell yeah what's this what's but it's because this? yeah it wasn't road tested at all but it was like so it was like bedroom tested yeah, from was, like Ross's. It was a bedroom project yeah. for like yeah. a year. Yeah. yeah, like definitely. Were you a singer before this group? Because they, they both spoke about having already been playing for a while, but had you been a singer before? No, I think the early days of the band, me and Ben were sort of doing vocals and I had guitar and I was playing lead guitar. But I think I was in a duo with my friend Alex and he was, he's the better singer. So he sung and I just led the guitar. Yeah, yeah. I realized you could shout really well. I just can't do that. No. I just immediately just need to cough and just throw up or something. But like, yeah. Rose can really shout so well. He could really project that. That was in those rehearsals where like, I'd sing like two or three songs and my voice would be gone completely. But I remember, I do remember early on, it was like, Ross can shout with like, inflection, if you yeah. get what I mean. Yeah. You can actually, I do remember that. First of all, like, he could just keep singing. You could still probably do that. Like, he can keep the, you've never really had much trouble with his um, voice. But like, you could actually, hear like some emotion and stuff like he could convey with the shout which was like incredible yeah. it was like this is obvious yeah and i was like yeah i'm not singing for <laughs> yeah this is, this is what we're doing yeah yeah, yeah. about how the pandemic maybe shaped or was you just had a different rollout than you might otherwise have had in terms of dropping music. How did you get noticed initially? What was the first sort of, I, you know, in America, like the idea that you would put out music and anybody would know or care is very foreign. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's very difficult. And it, is it the same thing in Ireland or is it, is there an easier path? Like, could you, could you just talk a little bit about like, how did you get from, okay, we're going to put out a song to somebody actually care? We definitely owe a lot to radio because yeah. thanks to a couple of uh, pals of bands here, they're in bands actually in Ireland. So mm -hmm. bass player and another guy, Adam. And then Nick and Long's bass player as well. They touched on this idea of radio plugging, and we had no idea what that was. It felt quite foreign and alien to us. We were like, okay, this is groovy. I'm not sure about going down this path. But through this, this, this service, we managed to get the song onto the, the airwaves on, on BBC Six Music, which is like a huge deal for like alternative music in the UK and Ireland. You know, it's it's the station you want to listen to discover new alternative bands. And it got on there, got onto Steve Lamax, Daily Show, onto the Round Table, and it ended up winning the, like the track of the week on that and then from there we just had promoters 
um, agents, emails all of a sudden coming through, and it just was so quick, it just a complete whirlwind those next few weeks. I think credit to we're film students, so Ben directed the music video and I shot it and edited it, and we had all of us were in the video, mm -hmm. and we came out of the out of it with this this product, like this aesthetic, and the video really helped yeah, for, the, for the debut single. It was, it's a really interesting thing because we really didn't know anything. The one thing we did know, well, we learned. We were so green. So it's this kind of thing just for people. It's like we just heard of like a radio plugger and it was basically you could pay someone just to show, just to show it to Radio 6 so it was able to just get it in the eyes of Radio 6 DJs. And then all we had was the song and we thought, well, we're film students, we'll make a video for it. So that's what we had. And then it's just like how these things happen. Just, it was like the one because we didn't have management or anything. We didn't really know how the industry worked. But it's just like the fortune of that song did well on the radio. When people then looked at us, all they saw was a video of that song, and it just happened to be. That was just enough for, as Luke said, like promoters, like some really good promoters gone, and then they put us in contact with our booking agent, mother artists, like, who very graciously decided, like, they wanted to work with us after just seeing the song, because we didn't, we couldn't also play. We, like, didn't have any gigs. We didn't have a set at that time either. We had one song. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is the thing as well. We, um, when we were having these conversations with people, we didn't exactly say we only had one song oh, to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and people were always asking us, do you have more music? Just with our, man our management yeah, as well, who, are, who, who then became our management. And we were, we were very good at being like, we're not quite ready yet. We, we have stuff. We're not, we, had, we didn't have anything. There's a lot of that in it. But, you know, other artists, I mean, they're the booking agency for like idols and foster the people and select like huge but so it's just one of those things where and when we got them we still didn't play a gig for like no but they were so months. good they were so patient with us clearly they have such a keen eye on scouting these new bands and, mm -hmm. and they were just happy to let us do our thing they, they thought they saw something in that video and the song mm -hmm. that was different and unique enough to like make a splash mm -hmm. in the scene Mm -hmm. And fair play to them, they took a gamble. We love those guys so much. You know, they've been, they basically were pseudo managing us for the first few months. They were yeah. giving us a lot of advice in emails and in Zoom calls and advising us on the next best steps. And we were eternally grateful to those guys, you know, still have that really strong relationship with them. And we, we couldn't have asked for a better no. booking agent to lead us through no. the unknown. And it gave us, it, it allowed us to gauge ahead of all these people we were going to meet, mm -hmm. like in the next year. like. Uh, that sort of gut feeling, that sort of trust. We knew that there were good people, we had that feeling. And we were able to build this sort of filter whenever we were deciding to work with certain people. Or We knew that Mother, them, them Natasha and James the benchmark. set the benchmark. And if we didn't feel right, we always would just compare it mm -hmm. to how they came across. And it was, it, yeah, was, it, really it, felt, yeah, it felt right. Yeah, so. definitely. It's the classic thing as well, where if we knew what we knew now, we never would have done what we did at all i couldn't even like because you got ahead of yourself is that or like you just like well yeah so that I, we wouldn't release a song and then not have any of our songs and not be able to play yeah, a gig nice. you know what i mean like it's ridiculous but that's what this is the brilliance of it as well and it's like i suppose it's you've just got to kind of do your own thing yeah i guess i wouldn't even advise people really to maybe just release the song and see what maybe you should but i think it's a kick up the ass yeah because it was a kick up the ass because we suddenly had pressure then okay we mm -hmm. got to deliver and start really taking this seriously and writing new stuff mm -hmm. but, but, yeah it's yeah. interesting because i i was very curious as to i i think you've answered the question but i want to i don't want to assume so i'll ask it is this scenario what's driving the EP as a format? Like just get enough songs together to release to keep the momentum going as opposed to a 10 or 12 track album? Is that sort of, is the EP a reaction to needing to have? We've talked a lot, we're great at talking about it. We've talked a lot about, I mean, one of the biggest things would probably be right now, or so we just put the second EP out, we weren't ready for an album, we just felt conceptually like it's a big thing for us, an album, and we were still Figuring, our, figuring ourselves out. That was definitely the first EP, maybe, was like taking it song by song, and then you're just, I suppose we treated the first EP like an album we had in our head, because it's like a, there's like a narrative for it and there's themes and all that kind of stuff. But I suppose, just off the top of my head, maybe six months ago, eight months, so we weren't ready for the debut album. 
Right. Well, the first EP was definitely single by single, and I think we realized after the fact that we had created some kind of narrative and story here. And so that was definitely something that came into the second EP, which in turn was, to be honest with you, an EP that came from the live show, and we started playing these songs live and thought, this is interesting, the crowd reaction we're gauging, how people are viewing these different songs, we were playing with different genres all of a sudden, like the song Claw, you know, we're just embracing that techno experience more, and we started to say, okay, hold on, we can piece together this and this narrative, and that's where Conditions 2 came into, really. We realized we had something coherent and we wanted to make EPs that weren't just a typical throw out a couple of songs and this here it is, an EP at the end. We wanted to have some kind of continuation and narrative element to it. Mm -hmm. To the album point, I think, like Ben said, we just weren't really ready for building that right now. I think we definitely will be very soon and we're very excited mm -hmm. for that. We're so excited to, to work on an album. Mm -hmm. But I think it just felt right between the three of us and between Chris as well, our producer, to, to work on these EPs and, and create something with those EPs and not just throw it out there. How did you connect with Chris? Um, well, we were aware of Chris's work with Enola Gay and Just Mustard and New Dad Irish band, so we just um, reached out. Sent and he's from Belfast as well, yeah, yeah. which was the big thing. Nope. There weren't really any other. I don't think there were any other. There was down south some options yes. maybe, but we, like in Belfast, he was the first choice, and we were delighted to get that email back that he wanted to work with us. But we were buzzing because we had honestly great. crowded him already doors like this is our guy like he was doing all the shoe gear stuff all the post punky stuff just felt perfect in that world and the way our relationship with him has blossomed in such a short space of time has been amazing mm -hmm. we just see chris as one of our closest friends and mm -hmm. another member of the band really yeah i've said in the past but he's like the fourth member unofficial yeah. member yeah we see him as it's like a george martin situation you know that yeah. the fourth chalk member he's just a great guy does he have his own studio he has a yes. home studio, yeah. He's a great drummer and great frontman of Rubicover Quartet, a band. He's a really cool band. He's a well. really cool band. Um, but I think the thing we love about Chris is just he's so experimental and willing mm -hmm. to just do whatever, like just get really weird in the studio and just try things. And yeah. We love that because we just kind of record things in layers. We're not like a live recording band. And so we no. can just experiment so much with it. Mm -hmm. And that, Chris is always great with yeah. that. It's that bedroom project feel as well. This, that chalk song could still be written on a laptop. Yeah. It doesn't need to be written in a room or anything. Yeah. But he sort of allowed us to flourish. And I think that's what a good producer does. And he's made us comfortable as well. So that's just a relationship that we've built on and will yeah. continue to. I'll always remember the first time we thought, okay, Chris is serious, was when we were in the studio recording the debut single. We'd never worked in the studio before, never worked with a producer before. And he just said, cut the entire first chorus, like just get rid of it, just lose the first chorus and just go into the second verse after a little long section. And I just thought, wow, okay. Because we immediately the weight came off the song, it just felt like way brighter and like just more engaging. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I just dropped the chorus and we were like, oh God, that's insane to just say that. And we tried to be like, okay, he is, he knows his stuff and this might work out here really well for us, you know? So that was that was a moment I'll always remember. Mm -hmm. Like just compositionally, you can just drop a chorus like that and it can really lift the song. We'll be back with more Spotlight On right after this break. Other than the podcast itself, the best way to stay in touch with our various goings-on is to be on our mailing list. To sign up, go to spotlightonpodcast.com and click on Newsletter. Thanks. And now, back to Spotlight On. Are all three of you in the studio for all sessions or because of the way the songs can come together? Do one of you go in and work for a while or pairs of you? Like how is there a way of working yet or? It oh, normally yeah. starts, yeah, like at home, a computer, I'm maybe coming up with some ideas and some lyrics and words and um, just programming some like simple drums or whatever. And, and then it, some, it normally moves to Luke's house where he's got his setup and I'll bring the setup. We work on the song a bit more. And then the three of us are together, maybe in the room where we rehearse or at Luke's, talking about the song a bit more, going back and forth throughout the demo, doing different versions of the song. And then when we're happy, we give it to Chris and um, go around to his house, do some pre-production. All three of us are there and then move it to the studio. And we're all there playing the parts. Yeah. And so, so you start so, again, or do you use the demo? Like, is the demo? Start with the demo, really? Yeah, really the that. demo, like, early on, Chris was very keen on some of the demo yeah. material. I, I'd say a lot of the music that you hear is from the demos. Mm -hmm. And I had no experience in, like, music production. It was just something that I learned a bit more about during the lockdown. But it was very nice to hear that Chris is sort of, yeah, keep whatever you're doing, don't change anything. Like, 
the sounds you're coming up with are quite raw and cool, yeah. and he can fix them. Acoustic um, round is cool, isn't it? Yeah. There's, I have like drum recordings just from my bedroom yeah. mm -hmm. of a snare, and that's still in the track, you know, the final product. And it's just like this rough recording I did just so I could send Ross it quick before I went to work or something. I just threw it together, and it's still in there. And Chris really embraces that. That's I love that. I love yeah. that in the production side. I think it's really cool. Are all of the drums live, or do you sample, or like how? There's, there's definitely elements of layering with with, with electronic drums and, and different elements of percussion. But I love getting in the studio, and the fact that all those live drums is, is in the song is it means a lot to me. You know, I never want to lose that connection with the drums. I think that's one of the cool things about our music is having live drums, mm -hmm. and it's still having this dance element to it. I think the live drums, I just love having that in the recording still. So they'll always be in there, but there might be certain songs where we embrace kind of electronic snare sounds more like Bliss, where you really get that kind of 80s new order kind of like snare sound. But yeah, I think we all like having live drums mm -hmm. rooted in there always. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So much of what you referenced only exists because of the technology, right? Like, and there's now a good at least 20 years into the ability for the first sort of consumer HD cameras were around, and you've mentioned the, so the audio production software multiple times, that allowed you to come out appearing fully formed, to present you know, a look, or a, what I heard was there was a universe that you were able to come out with, a sonic and visual mm -hmm. universe. And I'm really curious about the, the video portion in particular, because my, my perception is always, it's a little easier with audio, right? Because it's the different medium, but video, it's like a bit less forgiving. Like I'm watching it, it has to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. Does the film school background, like are you shooting above your weight in terms of the, the production value? Like how does your education impact what we're seeing on the screen? Uh, it's interesting because you know, it's like, well, the band itself was always very DIY driven. It was a very kind of important thing for us, like Ross especially, very early on. And it's really the same for the videos. It was important that, like most times, our videos is like crew of four, five, six, and like two of them are actors, you know what I mean? Just from our film backgrounds, we've worked on stuff with either has 10 crew, 20 crew. Me and Luke have worked on, um, we worked on Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> like, you know, which had, I don't know, was that like, I don't know, like 500 people or something so, like that? So there's a real freeing element. So the film school definitely helped. The videos were a very important way because it was something we could have complete creative control over ourselves. We really like black and white. It really works for us. We love digital. Digital is amazing, even though we push digital sometimes in our videos to look like film, but the manipulation of it is very, that's why digital, we're, we're big fans of it and being able to do unlimited possibilities. But the black and white really helped because we love it, but we were shooting it on like a DSLR and like that Ross's step dance, like really good DSLR. I, and, and Ross is like shooting it, but because we wanted to look like 60s black and white movies, like half of our videos, like there's spots on the camera, you know, like there's dirt on it. And that's not intentional at all. But thankfully, yeah, thankfully you that was a little good. hair sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But it's just because we're doing that and we're just trying to do very, we just like that stark black and white and it just, thankfully so happens to favor that kind of DIY yeah. approach. But it was very much us. That was what was so great about it. And I think that's one thing we knew, even though we only had one song from that, we wanted to be able to create something, a music video that was in service to the song, but could also live alongside it. And basically it had to be a music video that established who we were as a band without us being in it as well. And I think it definitely achieved that, even achieving it and just it made people ask more questions. It was like our one thing we had just to get people interested at work. Which was so, right. Something that strikes me about what you were saying at the very beginning was the small crew and a couple of actors. And in the limited, ex limited experience I've had making film, it always seems, especially when it's DIY filmmakers, it's like everybody works on everybody else's project. So somebody might need a script supervisor. And so you might have different credit on five different projects because you're helping your friend make their thing. And then when it's your turn, they come and yeah. they, you know, yeah. tote the lights or whatever for you. Mm -hmm. Does having access to all those different skill sets 
play a part in this? Totally, but what was great was we kind of went through film school and working on other films. We made the films knowing we could make them with three or four people, you know, yeah. but that is, we're all doing like camera and lighting. I mean, they're all natural lights. Like we shoot stuff like in our living room, you know, with the black sheet over it, stuff like that. The band members are also the actors like in costume or like our friends, you know what I mean? Luke is like the big. He's got the sheet over the it. Big, the big demonic, demonic ghost thing. Standing yeah, on like an apple box, you know, so he's yeah. like eight foot tall, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I just have like Sam or uh, producers and all that stuff like <laughs> yeah. in there with me holding the stool and the game because it was just yeah. a drip. Yeah. It's like the grand tradition of still again. Yeah. 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 It was just a really nice way of it was making our videos is for me what I thought movie making was when I was a kid. Basically, mm. it really is you just go and make something cool with your friends and it's not like whenever something has like a 20 grand or 50 grand or five million dollar or we've worked on a film that had a 200 million dollar budget you know it's not like that at all and when you even go to film school you start learning the ways you're supposed to do stuff all the department heads yeah. and all that shit yeah. you know yeah the, which is great and you need to do them but so the music videos for us it, it really is it's nice i suppose it's like anything it's the less people involved just choose as many key collaborators as you can just to and everyone's on the same page to make a cohesive vision but also we love collaboration as well Do any of you worry that as success starts to come your way, that potentially you'll have access to more resources and it might jeopardize the thing that's been special so far? Like, how, do you think about that at all? Or is that like, why worry about that today? Or? Yeah, probably. Think, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Nice problem to have type thing. Maybe it's one of those because fundamentally everything is done because of lack of resources as well really i mean we didn't i'm sure we would have made videos with 20 people if we could have you know what right, i mean right. so i mean but i mean we enjoy it and it's the same thing and it's also like you have to have a this if you don't have a massive gigantic network of people you do just do stuff yourselves yeah um that's just the reality the minute we're forced yeah. to do it the way you guys are doing it and the way you're directing it so that's just the way it's our hand is forced at the minute yep. it's hard to know when, when there's more resources involved how that will all go down. Well, I guess we'll find out at some point. Yes. Yeah. Is it important to you guys to not be on camera other than with a hooded? <laughs> well, no, so we did the first, we just did a video for our last song, which came out a few weeks ago. Yeah. And we were in it. Oh, okay. And that's a big thing for that us. That was a big deal, yeah. And that was a big Can't deal, because we did like some- Sort of a Pink thing. Floyd thing, like yeah, not gonna be on the yeah, album yeah. covers, yeah. not gonna- <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, but it, it felt right for the song. Yeah. It would be our most, indie or like pop oriented song is a stupid word to throw out for Absolutely. you know what i mean yeah but that's how it's it going to be the felt. big breakthrough <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, some faces in. it yeah. was written a year ago i yeah. think this time when i said to them that we're, I've, we've got a pop song on our hands here but we just need a chop. and that was very exciting as well like that was great but yeah that's why that kind of it's like if we're ever going to do one it should be this one because you know if you can't experiment like What's the point? Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. I'm really curious about the live shows and about the live presentation of this music. When I was first listening, going through all the music and listening and then reading some other interviews, they were from a different point in time where you were alluding to like just starting to get on stage and build the show. And you guys talked a little bit earlier about sort of the evolution with that. The video from KEXP was definitely helpful to, to watch because I was very intrigued. And it's something that's actually been interesting about this visit to South by in particular. There are so many bands that don't have the sort of traditional guitar, bass, drum, keyboard setup 
And it's really fun to stand there as an audience member and be like, where the fuck is all that sound coming from? Mm -hmm. Is everybody like using all their limbs to make noise? I feel like it's finally electronic based or electronic heavy music is really starting to find a compelling live presentation that equals what a great rock band can do, where you could actually watch people and be intrigued. I don't know, it's, it's an exciting moment to see. And so I, I went into looking for some video of you all live to, to see how do they pull this off. It was only a little bit into, I, I think Static is the first track. I was like, oh, okay, I get this. <laughs> this, is, this is like, this is heavy shit. Yeah. One thing I'm curious about in that video, it seems to be fairly relentless. It's track after track. Was it edited that way, or is that your live presentation? Like, you get on stage and it's boom, we just keep going with yeah, no stops. That's live. Yeah, it's, it's one after the other. We set it up that way. We know exactly the set list before going on. So there's sometimes transitions in between the songs, but the idea is for early days, it was like, it's just like a DJ set. We wanted to sort of meld the tracks one after the other seamlessly. Some tracks, there's just a small gap of audio, but it's all pre-planned. That's there's pretty much no silence. That's why I like I'm always tuning my guitar. Because so I, you're leaving an audience, like the idea is like the audience is going to be pummeled. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and why we have short enough sets, because it's quite a physical, like there is no, it's the it's like Ross said, it's a DJ set, it doesn't stop, basically. And yeah, it's, it's great that the KXP was able to encapsulate that just in 17 minutes but like that is like our live show it's like when it's like 40 minutes it's just yeah it doesn't stop at the start there's like parts of the set where people weren't sure if the song was over they had the clap and oh i think we thought like yeah. little illusion and just something a bit different for an audience member like they're not sure whether to dance or mosh like, there are no applause or, breaks as well. yeah because yeah. yeah, we don't just stop and say okay there's your time to applaud audience let me do the next one like it's it's just like let's keep going and people can just get on the train with us you know what i mean and let's just see how this goes and every gig was different because of that at the start, you know? Do you, can you see a world where you build up to like a 70 minute set that's like that? Can you do that? Yeah. Working on it. <laughs> Working on it. Well, yeah. that's why we have a song like Kevlar say, actually, that's very, that's a good point. Yeah. There's a song on the album, which is uh, a live set, which is just Ross singing. So maybe that's also like- So you break. get a break, like you guys can just like cool out for a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I gotta get a break in somewhere as if yeah. wrists, you know, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, we love time with the live set. And like Ross said, the DJ set thing, like we just thought, let's try this as a band set up and just see what people think of it. And I think people have grabbed onto that yeah. and we just love doing it that way. I think we'll just continue with that. Is everything generated live or are you triggering pre-recorded things? Tracks, yeah. And, yeah. Tracks There's and tracks triggers. in there, so we don't have a bass player live, of course, so most of what you're going to hear in the tracks is just pumping bass, like just through the, through the system, but yeah. uh, there's definitely little elements of percussion in there, little kind of little vocal effects scattered in there. And, and you're all just there. triggering stuff as you, like, it's just, yeah. you're playing yeah. and you're, yeah, you know, it's crazy. crazy things. But yeah, I mean, I think it's honestly like bands like Death Grips, we love Death Grips and yeah, yeah. those guys run tracks and but it's the energy they bring to the stage is what really grabs you and captivates mm -hmm. people. And I think with three of us, there's a bit of extra pressure on us to really give energy and, and mm -hmm. go for it. But I think all of us just feel incredibly painful after a gig because we're throwing our necks and our bodies yeah. around. We're all like old men, really, mm -hmm. deep down, I think, because I have a bad neck after yeah. every gig. Like, he's yeah. always oh, been moving loads. Yeah. But I think, like, we love that. Like, we don't, honestly, I think the way the world's going, there's so many bands running tracks now, and, like, yeah. it's just yeah. part of that way to get bigger sound. We can't really afford to pay a lot of people to kind of come in and play with us right now. So no. this is, as a three, how we've achieved the sound on stage. Mm -hmm. It was also our band, and we never knew, you know, before we ever played, we just had to make a decision where, okay, do we become a five piece now to make this pay this live or do we figure out how to do it as a free and then make it and that was like a big thing for us because we didn't like you know we didn't just like start with a five piece and then yeah. just well away it's, it's just the bands are three of us so we're going to perform it as the free yeah and the three has just become this thing now this kind of visual representation of the band we have the three of us in a line on stage mm -hmm. there's no drums if we can festivals it can be difficult sometimes yes. but with a change of changeovers but drums are always on the kind of stage right rather than back and center you know yeah. we just have this line of the three of us i think that's really worked for us as well and it's just something slightly different for an audience member to look at and think yeah, yeah. okay it's not the normal drums are in the back you can't see the drummer you know uh, for me that's lovely in a selfish way you know i'm just like i'm up front this yeah. is really cool and we love that layout on stage yeah that's yeah. fun yeah fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's cool it's really an exciting time to like i was saying earlier like that the formula it can can be blown up now. Yeah. yeah, and it does feel better. We've had, I think, zero pushback 
I'm trying to think of anyone being funny about the way we, because we, because uh, we really went into it being like, we are here to put on a show as well. We can provide that show. It doesn't matter. How and do you do it? Yeah, because we are able to, and people are. I think I think it's just all about how people leave after you finish playing. That's really what matters. How yeah, they yeah. feel after it, and we've just had a positive response. For you. We haven't had too many like analog heads or anyone being like telling us like you can't do that really so i think that that, that, that train has left the station yeah, anybody yeah. who wants to be that way is just being painted. yes yeah yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> no, it's true. It's yeah. True. and uh, to be honest with you i think we speak for always here we love getting those little questions about how did you achieve that like we love great sharing that with people on the mystery of it yeah. some people might not know how that works yeah and i was like that's cool love that love the mystique of it so yeah i got asked the question we did a festival show when i was doing the vocal effects the, the delays and someone told me they were having an argument with their friend about how it was being done was i triggering it or was it someone like off stage or was it pre-recorded yeah so that's cool yeah it's awesome i, I think it's great I, and as an audience member it's just fun to see and like it's just yeah. different there's not a, you go see a rock band traditional rock band if you yeah. will not a lot of mystery and you can yeah. love it in different ways yeah, it just adds to the it just we, adds we like the i feel like the more tour we are very open about saying stuff and kind of say but we do love the mystery as well because i think that's always like we like talking about stuff but i do know as soon as you do reveal a lot of stuff it removes that and people like the mystique i like the mystique as well yeah. i don't like knowing how the sausage is made yeah, kind of yeah. thing you know there's just something cool about it it keeps you guessing and thinking you don't want to answer every question under the sun you know? i saw a band last night mong tong it was billed as a taiwanese psychedelic band and i was like i'm signing up for that, that sounds great and it was it's two guys mm -hmm. one has a bass strapped to him the other has a guitar strapped to him they both have what look like the same kind of setups that Kraftwerk has. Cool. Like you can't tell if it's a keyboard or just some kind of modular synth thing <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And then, so they're next to each other with these stations. And then in between them, if they turn and face each other, they have these rolling drum pads. Cool. They come out, they put on blindfolds. Whoa. They pull the blindfolds down so you could definitely tell they're not cheating. And they start like hitting things with sticks and one guy has a, a, a Chinese flu. There's delays and there's processing. And it gets to the point where you can't even tell like what's looped, what's live, what's yeah. sampled. Some of it was incredibly abstract. Some of it was incredibly like rhythmic and, and dancey. It was, it was pretty crazy. So if you have a chance to see them. I, yeah, I, I, what are they called again, sir? Mong Tong, M-O-N-G-T-O-N-G. It was right. crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. I didn't even think of something we want to play. I'd love to play around with that more. We love that band. Holy F. Holy, Holy fuck. fuck. Yeah. Holy fuck. It's um, a podcast. We can say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Like they're creating it all there in the flesh. Like all these loops, it's all happening. There's nothing wow. being thrown through a computer. Like they're and like that's so interesting. Like creating yeah. that because it's gonna be different every time. I get. You have to thank Ed Sheeran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Ed Sheeran, man. the king of <laughs> the main looping <laughs> standard. Yeah. Yeah. The reason our band exists yeah. Yeah. is that just he showed the world yeah. this yeah, yeah. is what it is. Yeah. 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 I mean, say what you want. To, to, to be able to pull that off in a stadium by yourself. That's, that's kind of like, crazy, actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Jesus yeah. Christ. No, I do. I, I'll be there to say agree with you. I, I do think it's not my it's not my trip, but man, I it's it, yeah, it takes some kind of and people are willing to see it and pay for it and be so that shows and that shows the power of the songs. And if you can give a good performance, no matter what, that's all people give a shit about. Yeah. As well. Yeah. In this moment I said
What's next? Like, are you staying in the States and doing shows, or do you have to split? Like, what's the... Oh, well, we're here for the next couple of days. We're just going to take in the city, I think. And we're going to Waterhole today. Barton, Barton Springs. Spring. Spring. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 The, uh, the natural pool. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we had we got some barbecue on the first day. I think we're just we're all kind of foodies. Yeah, we're kind of enjoying Austin. But you're but you're you're not here to tour. You're not. No, no, no. We're heading back on Saturday, and yeah. then we the could tour. We are in Dublin like midday, and then we have a day off, and then it's the UK tour. We're doing like ten shows or something, or eleven shows around the UK after that. So it's yeah, be a good couple of weeks. Yeah. I would imagine you guys are going to get a reputation as a band that is scary for other bands to let open for them <laughs> after after watching that video like i wouldn't want to go on stage after that man <laughs> well funny we've only how many bands we've only ever opened once i suppose and it was our first gig yeah we don't really get offers i don't think we've ever no we don't really get offers well, but we did never, i think that was like a, something was set up with the mother they never yeah. they wanted us to have our own headline shows and just push that or rather yeah. supporting early doors and i think that helped us as well that was cool that they were just like if you guys never want to support that's cool is what they said because yeah. they had artists that did that and we thought that's what you had to do you had to support and you know we're open for and like we there is stuff down the line that we're excited about doing in that regard but they just kind of like you don't have to do that you know which is cool i mean i feel like because you know when you play festivals you i know it's not supporting people but you do play after people and before people yeah and there's like a that. hierarchy yeah so you do i do feel like we get that experience anyway <laughs> well it must be a, a great confidence boost to hear from people like an experienced high-level booking agent say you can do it your way we yeah. believe enough in this that we'll do it that way if you want to do it yeah. Yeah. one of the one last thing something that struck me also when listening to the music and watching the video was i would love to see it in a small cramped club like with just that energy contained but you could also imagine it in the sort of expanse of a field on, on a festival stage so I, it's really neat that it can that it can scale Mm -hmm. that, that as long as the out. small room system is good enough, yeah. you can have a great... Cause Without you blowing it out. <laughs> that's the one, yeah. Because the one that is like, we've had some amazing sweaty gigs, but when the system is good and you can get a good enough system in those kind of sweaty gigs, it can be a really great show. But we have so, like, it really helps the low end for it. If we can have something that can help the bass and stuff, you can really feel it, you know? Another thing as well is if it's a festival outdoors, nighttime is obviously gonna really help us. Yeah. Because we love strobe, we love just having yeah. this crazy mm -hmm. light show if we can. And definitely depend at night time if it's yeah. a festival helps. I mean, we have played like bright summer's day. Yeah. And it's funny, like we had this joke about playing Kevlar in Beauregard in France and just the middle of the beautiful countryside chateaus in France. We're playing this, this song. Yeah, it's crazy. Sad, so we, it was mental. This really it. sad, like emo, like weird, industrial, yeah. atmospheric song in the middle of the beautiful summer. Everyone's having a pint. It was also our seventh show ever and it was to like 8,000 people. And nobody knew who we were because how could you? And we were just playing this mad industrial and it was yeah. so bright. I mean, we love France so much. We've had a lot of big first experiences there and we, we play there all the time we've got some really cool stuff coming up in France um but yeah we that was our cherry there with we played to the most people we could ever imagine playing to it yeah it's three o'clock in the afternoon but to your point is we want to be able to play the sweatiest show in a Grammy pub and also be able to play a crazy festival stage like we want to be to like to 20, people people. and let that experience still be special so. well I hope you guys get back over to the states I look forward to seeing you uh, yeah, um, so. thank you for making time thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you so much to Chalk Ross Ben and Luke and as always thank you for listening to Spotlight On a production of 23 Media Ventures I'm your host and executive producer Lawrence Purrier we're produced and edited by Michael Donaldson with theme music by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. If you'd like to support our work, please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com. There you will find our free episode archive, weekly postings on our official blog, and a ton more. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch.